Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Entrepreneurship Matters. My name is Alicia Wilson. I'm Vice President for Economic Development for Johns Hopkins University and Johns Hopkins Health System. And it is my pleasure to host this session of Entrepreneurship Matters featuring gentlemen who are leaders in the furniture manufacturing and furniture design industry. Let me um, welcome, present to some of you, introduce to others, Nick Mata, as well as Daryl P. Patterson that I'm gonna to invite to come on screen. And I'm gonna give you their bios, not do justice to it, but you'll see why when we have our conversation. Uh, and we will get into all the questions that you may have as well. We know that successful entrepreneurs, successful businesses are not built in a day. That it takes hard work, a lot of grit, a lot of passion to make it work. And these two entrepreneurs are no different. So Nick and Daryl, come on screen. I'm gonna give your bios and they're gonna launch right into the conversation. So first, let me introduce you to Daryl Patterson. He is an art enthusiast, artist and designer in that order. He was raised in Washington, D.C. in Prince George's County with three other siblings by a single mom. His fascination with art and design began at age 12. Like many of his contemporaries, he pursued a safe career path, earning a bachelor's of science in finance and a master's in public administration. It was not until his mother's passing in 2010 that he rediscovered his passion for design. Wood and textiles are his chosen mediums. His aesthetic is undoubtedly influenced and informed by modern Asian design, functional and quietly elegant. Balancing both complex and simple geometric style elements, he strives to create art objects that have practical utility. You'll see them in a minute. This approach to design is reflected in his product line of wood, cutting boards, trays, a first attempt at make creating functional art. Most of his designs are formed from American black walnut, but other wood species are used to create his limited edition productions. Uh, he founded D. Patterson Design Studio in 2013 and is currently co-founder of Aside Design Studio in Lottie's Place with his business partner, Lawrence Moore. Welcome, Daryl, on to Entrepreneurship Matters. It's a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. And Nick Mata of Monkey in the Meadow. I love that um, that business name. It's the best, uh, it really is. Nick is a college graduate with a BA in both economics and business management. Also, he has an MBA with a concentration in finance. He has eight years of experience in consumer, commercial, and institutional finance. Currently, he has 10 plus years of owning and operating hospitality properties in Pennsylvania. He started a custom furniture company from scratch in 2012 and successfully has operated for 10 plus years. Monkey in the Metal is a furniture fabrication company that provides artistic design solutions by creating striking pieces imagined from our surroundings. They strive to build items that are unique and reflect the design that is modern, industrial, and functional. A style that can be summed up, listen to this, as warm industrial. I love that. It's a nice um, phrasing of it. They are creators of all things metal, wood, and reclaimed objects. Welcome, Nick, to Entrepreneurship Matters. So glad to have you on today. Thanks for having us, Lisa. Absolutely. So let me um, let me go back, and I'll start with Daryl. What inspired you to want to become an entrepreneur? You talk about this moment in 2010, passing of your mom. What, what, what led up to that? What, what fueled that passion? Well, basically the desire to create a life on my terms. And what does that mean? Um, having a mind and resources to define what the success means to me. You know, mm -hmm. I have the capacity to serve the community in a meaningful way that's intentional and productive. No, no, no. Really, life in your own terms. I like, I like that. And we've heard that from many other entrepreneurs. How about you, Nick? What inspired you to want to go into entrepreneurship? Sure. Well, I grew up in a household where both parents were entrepreneurs. They 30 plus years and so worked in a good bit of my youth. And I would own my business someday. Uh, you know, the opportunity for furniture was really just born out of 
building things wanted and loved to do that. So I just need for it. Uh, as I really high prefer to meet my expectation. And so I designed you know, my own furniture for those and then saw that there were that people wanted me to build the same practicality and use of material. And that's really what inspired me to turn this more uh, a hobby or professional hobby into an actual business. Excellent, excellent. And I know you, um, I know, and, and let me tell you, these two gentlemen are actually in their businesses and Nick is on uh, his headphones. You were going in and out just a little bit, Nick. Oh, um, but we'll, um, don't worry, it's, uh, I think it's the AirPods being unfaithful. But we will, um, don't worry, we're going to continue with the conversation and, and make sure you're all technically taken care of. Um, so take us back and say, so both of you clearly very talented. Um, are artists um, as well as designers and creators and creatives. But how did you take that talent and say, I'm going to make it into a business? So what were the steps that you went through once you decided entrepreneurship is for me? What, how did you build a business? So I'll start with you, Daryl, and then Nick. Oh, oh, I'm always on first. Okay. No, no, I might switch it up. I might switch it up in just a minute. I might switch it up in just a minute. Don't worry. Oh, it's it's okay. It's okay. Um, the truth is, um, there were no steps per se. Um, it happened organically. Um, in 2000, I resigned from the federal government to pursue a career as a professional distance runner. And in 2003, I had an accident, um, a car accident that sort of changed. Um, that um, career path, if you will. You know, um, when I resigned, I was um, designing or restoring historic hardwood floors in Washington, D.C. And after my accident, which resulted in, a, in the loss of a, uh, my left index finger, the doctor told me to uh, do something with small objects to uh, sort of hang with my atrophy. And um, I went to a wood shop, Woodworkers Club in Brockville, and I started doing uh, woodworking um, and making these cutting boards as therapy. Fast forward to 2012, one of my mentors and friends, um, Bo Shaw of Middle Kingdom Porcelain, asked me to bring one of those boards to the New York Now show in New York City. And that one board turned into a business. It went a leaf fall. Five years later, in 2017, I met my current business partner, Lawrence Moore of Heavy Paper Co. at one of Baltimore's premier maker spaces, um, Open Works, mm -hmm. in Greenmount Avenue, um, on Greenmount Avenue. And um, during the um, height of the pandemic in 2020, we both needed a place to practice because Open Works had closed down. And it was then they started, you know, deciding let's get, let's do something collaboratively. And that was born. Um, there you go. We have um, Asha Design Studio and the retail extension of that, which is Lottie's Place, which is sort of a showroom slash um, store that has handmade goods from local artisans as well as those nationally and um, internationally. Excellent. I know you tried to act like this. Y'all just did this on the back of an envelope, but y'all that that shows a real progression of a brand. I, I took down notes. I took down five points that you talked about. One, you were employed um, in the federal government, retired, and then really when you were restoring historic floors, then really sadly had an injury, but led you to the work that you're doing now through woodworking, utilizing that as therapy, had an opportunity to go to the, a New York show, which turned the boards that you were making for therapy into a business. And then five, you know, utilizing resources in your community like OpenWorks, then starting a business and finding a business partner, which, you know, it was organic because it looks like a serendipity in so many moments. It was, but yes. Really, you you really were building unknowingly a business based on your passion. Uh, Subconsciously, and, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Great, great story. And what I don't want to portray is like, you know, I, I sat down and uh, masterminded this 
uh, or that we masterminded this um, wonderful business plan to get this started because we're still learning. Yes. Um, but, it, you know, we are, uh, we took a leap of faith. Let's, uh, let's give this a try and um, see where it goes. No, I, I, I like that. And that, that's helpful because so many people who are watching, so many uh, others who are artists may say, I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have a business plan at this point. And they can listen to you and figure out like how they can do it, how they can think about just the platforms and the opportunities that can ultimately lead them to a business. Nick, how about you? What, what, what steps did you go through? Talented, you're in finance. Um, but then you, you, you know, you're watching your parents, seeing them be entrepreneurs, and then realize you have this talent that you're going to make into a business. How did you take it from idea and concept to a business? Sure. Uh, first, am I, am I coming through right? A little choppy. A little choppy, but I'm always just, uh, you know, go off the uh, Right. Is that any better? Oh, excellent. Excellent. We hear you clear. Yeah. All right. We'll just, we'll roll with that. Uh, so yeah, I apologize for hearing machinery in the background. My walls are pretty paper thin here. Uh, but yeah, if I want to talk about, you know, the, the path of how I got here, you know, I'll, I'll kind of go back to how I got into metalworking, which was with a, you know, a 1973 Toyota Land Cruiser I bought right out of college. Uh, my parents thought I was crazy. And, uh, but, you know, this was like my hobby at the time. And, you know, as I got better with fixing it, I had to learn how to do more skills. And then eventually I got to a point where I need to start welding on it. But I thought, well, I shouldn't start welding on something I'm going to be driving down the road with no basis or knowledge. So I took night classes and became a certified welder. So I would feel more confident in my skills than when I would start working on the truck. And, uh, you know, that led into one thing, which led into another. Then I started building furniture for my house and started building furniture for others. And, you know, this was like, a serious hobby turned professional hobby. And then one day I said, well, I'm doing the seven days a week now at, at, on the nights and the weekends. Uh, you know, I either need to kind of step on this a little bit and reclaim some of my life back, or I need to give this runway and see what happens. And, uh, you know, I was having so much fun doing it. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, having this not be a full part of my life. So I gave it some runway. We rented a space. I started buying some tools and then you know, we started hiring employees. It's, you know, been a, a wild and crazy adventure. Uh, and, you know, I love every minute of it. I love, I love all, I took down six points that you talked about. Um, one that, uh, what was the 1973 car? What was the car? Toyota Land Cruiser. Oh, oh okay. All right. Like and, whoa, 1973 Toyota Land Cruiser. Okay. So that's how it started all. Two, you know, you, you then went and educated yourself about the fine points of your craft. So you went took night classes on welding. Third, you started building furniture for yourself. Fourth, and I'm going to give this to you because I think it is true. You then did your friends and family round by building furniture for others. So really you, you did your friends and family round of funding by building, building for others. Five, realized that it was consuming more and more of your time and then really came to that critical point which many of the entrepreneurs that come on here talk about is like when do you leap into entrepreneurship doesn't look like anybody like tiptoes it usually is a leap you leaped in when you started saying seven days a week if I want to reclaim some of my time and make this a business to do that and then um you then rent a space set up the business as, as it is now and, and now are engaged in that. I think all great points for people taking notes. I'm taking notes for you, so don't worry. If you're taking notes, I'm, I'm going to get all of them in. And let me just say, I see so many of you on Facebook and in the chat, and those of you texting your questions in, feel free to do that. You put them in the chat on Facebook, put them in the chat on Zoom. You also can, those of you listening on the phone, text them 22333 type J-H-U-W-L in the message and I'll get all of those in. Um, let me get to one of the questions that we received on Facebook, which is um, how did you know when to take the pivot into entrepreneurship? Um, and, you know, I'll start, I'll start with you, Daryl, first, um, because you talked about, you know, the show that you went to, but you could say, you know, that, that just was a one-off. How did you know it was time to start a business? And then Nick, I'm going to go to you because it seems like you probably were spending seven days in your business for a while. 
before you took the leap. So what was the critical moment when you knew I need to now take the leap into entrepreneurship? So Daryl, what, what was that point for you? Well, let me preface my comment by first saying, you know, I did return to federal service in 2009. So I'm doing okay. all of this. I am currently employed um, in the federal government, um, but I'm, I'm close to retirement. And I wanted to sort of, um, you know, establish something to go into a transition into retirement and really um, have something that I'm passionate about. Not that I'm not passionate about my current job or my career, because I, I do enjoy everything that I have done and accomplished in federal service, but um, this is a creative outlet for me. Mm -hmm. And when I met Lawrence and um, I saw his enthusiasm, you know, I was trying to do something we, not the one of us have ever had um, the experience of entrepreneurship, you know, prior to our, um, you know, um, our recent um, ventures. And we have never owned and operated a store. Mm. But I said, it's, it's, the time is now. Yeah. It was that it's like, okay, yes, let's do this. And then for me personally, I wanted to always have a legacy, mm -hmm. a durable legacy. And, um, you know, Lawrence was gracious enough to let us know, um, to let us have the name Lottie. Uh, Lottie's place. That's my mother's name. That was her name. Oh, and that's so, amazing. you know, if you look behind us, it's like, you know, community, I mean, home, our community, um, sort of celebrating her legacy as a missionary. Um, she really helped uh, women transition from um, environments of domestic violence. And we are very intentional about promoting uh, women um, artisans and artists in our store. Um, as well as to those uh, minorities or those on the fringe of, um, you know, our um, or marginal communities, if you will, or marginalized communities. But um, it was, I think, when someone, it was my ex-boss mm -hmm. at FDA, when he retired. He retired in 2020. And um, he was a man of integrity. He was like the big brother I never had. Mm -hmm. And he's told me, you have it to do. You just have to have faith and trust. And although I've tested this, you know, I've done the whole thing, optimal doership back in 2000, you know, I never had anyone to speak those words to me. Yeah. Lots of support, lots of support and care yeah. from friends, family, and lots of opportunities presented to me, but someone to speak to me on that level. Yeah. It looked me in my eyes to tell me, you know, and I was like, okay, thank you. That's, That's that is a really important point. Uh, what was his name? What's his, what is Al it? Albert Connolly Jr. I love him until the day goes, you know, to the day ends. He's, um, he is a wonderful person, was a beautiful um, leader and mentor, taught me all that I know. Yeah. Uh, how, how to be a leader, how to be an effective leader, and um, what integrity really means. That's, that, it, it's so much packed into that, what you just said in that story. And I was asking his name, because you know, you, you, many times we gloss over that, but I wanted to lift his name up because really what he did was speak life over your dreams. Yes. yes. And, um, and as we think about entrepreneurship and we think about the journey that so many people are on as they, entrepreneurs on the like it is important to be an albert in someone's life yes right and to speak life over someone's dreams because you don't that was the catalyst from what you said that was that was the tipping point yes that made you take another step forward and so just a beautiful story about what how powerful words are and how yes. powerful how powerful you can be in just affirming individuals beautiful beautiful Thank you for sharing that, Daryl. Nick, how about you? Um, what did, what made you, what has made you sort of like say, I'm going to start now versus five years from now versus two years before? What was the, what was the critical moment for you? Sure. You know, it was one of those things where when I was doing this more as a professional hobby and you know, I was actually trying to sell some of the pieces, but I, you know, always kind of told myself, well, as long as I sell enough to like, 
you know, cover some rent of the space or cover the purchase of a tool, then, mm -hmm. then I'm fine. You know, I wasn't paying myself really a salary. I just enjoyed the craft and I really liked doing it. And uh, I think the, you know, the pivot point for me, you know, when I said, I just, I, I got to go, I got to do this. You know, I was looking at it. I was looking at the hours I was working, you know, I had small kids at home and I was like, well, I'm missing time with them because I, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to do this in, on the side. And mm -hmm. uh, I was like, well, I, I can do this. I can do less of this and spend more time at home or we can actually, you know, hire people, try to make this a business, charge a shop rate instead of something scribbled down on a napkin and uh, make an actual business out of it. And so what was the, the tipping point for me was you know, thinking about this intentionally and saying, okay, if five years from now, 10 years from now, I don't do this, am I going to have a regret? And, mm. and that was it. That, that, was, that was the key right there. I said, well, if I don't do this now, it's only going to be harder to do it later. And yeah. I'm going to regret not doing it uh, because I'm going to get more and more entrenched in life. And you know, 10, 12 years ago, I had less commitments. And so I was like, if I'm going to do it, let's do it now. If I'm going to fail, fail early and uh you know hopefully fail well uh and you know <laughs> I, I would say that you know it's it's been a journey you know there's been lots of ups and downs and, you know probably one of my accomplishments is not quitting uh that is you know the, the biggest thing it's just getting up every day and doing it uh and then stopping and kind of smelling roses every once in a while like looking around because uh you know sometimes you can, can kind of get in your own head and uh you know when, when that happens i kind of look around the shop and like well, this wouldn't have been here unless I took that step. And you know, yeah. I'm really grateful that I did. Yeah. So many great points you just made. So many gems you just dropped. You had that critical moment. Will I regret not starting now, five years from now? And that answer of yes, you will. Because as life moves on, life continues to carry on you. You do get more entrenched. I love how you talked about if I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail early and, and embracing that as a part of, of the journey. The other thing, um, the, the point that you made, which I think was really, really great, was it is an accomplishment not to quit. It is, it is actually an accomplishment not to give up. And so beautifully stated and beautifully um, talked about one uh, question um, that we received uh, on Facebook was, what's the hardest part of being in your industry? You're in, I mean, we have never had furniture designers or furniture manufacturers on Entrepreneurship Matters. So you are in rare air, right? You are in a niche market. What's the hard part? Someone's asking, what's the hardest part about being in your industry? I'll start with you, Nick, because I'm picking on I pick on Daryl every time to go first. <laughs> Nick, I'll go, go to you first. What's the hardest part about being in the furniture industry? Uh, yeah, I mean, because there's there's a couple parts to it. Uh, you know, the, the first one is, and this is just in most recent memory, uh, you know, our clientele and the products that we primarily built were predicated on new office builds. Uh, so uh -huh. then the pandemic occurred, new office builds went to zero. And that meant that the products and the clientele that we had didn't want that anymore. And so we went from building a lot of conference tables, which we were really good at, and we really enjoyed. And, you know, that was kind of like our bread and butter. You know, that was our base business. You know, as long as we built, you know, a couple of conference tables every month, we could do some of the other fun stuff and we were going to be fine. Uh, but then that whole industry changed. And, you know, overnight that all went away. And so we had to pivot and we found ourselves in new areas and new industries and doing things that maybe we dabbled in before, or maybe we looked at, but we didn't really give it a lot of interest and we found a way into multifamily. And what I mean by that is that, you know, a lot of multifamily builders or apartment builders were adding some really nice amenity spaces to their buildings to try to help keep the mm -hmm. uh, tenants a little happier because they are all trapped in their apartments as well. And uh, we, we found ourselves building some really cool things from, you know, signage to artwork, you know, taking apart old pinball tables and turning them into coffee tables, uh, you know, just like really neat things that we would have never thought of. And you know, when we looked back on 2021, we did our, you know, our audit of the year, like what went well and what didn't go so well. We realized we'd only built two tables that entire year. Uh, we, we took a business that primarily built tables and then we rarely built a table last year. Uh, so wow. That was, you know, that was the story of it. 
Well, I mean, I think it's so interesting because COVID allowed for you to really actually see where you can have an expansion of your business, right? You became, I mean, you're creative, clearly. You went from making coffee table for offices and then moved into the residential. Because uh, um, all of you, if you haven't watched the, the beginning part of the show, you'll see the beautiful pictures of both Nick and Daryl's um, designs and their furniture. Uh, and I would have thought that you were always doing um, residential and multifamily because your designs are just so beautiful. Um, but really interesting to know how you really took advantage of um, of the pandemic to really think about a, a, a different line of business and maximize on that. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a big business disruptor for us. I mean, the other one that's always been there and still continues to be there uh, is, is sourcing of talent. You know, these mm. are not primarily jobs that people get trained for. Uh, yeah. This is not, you know, the vocational technical schools uh, don't exist in the numbers that they do. And, you know, even the ones entering the trade aren't necessarily honed in towards furniture making. That's a really, really niche area. Uh, and so that's been our continual struggle is to find talent, find that next generation of builders. And I have some really great and seasoned builders on our, on our team here but I'm trying to find the next group, like who's going to take us into the next 10, 20, 30 years. And that's, you know, been the continual struggle to find those people that are interested in the technical arts and want to pursue this as a career. That's really, I mean, that's, uh, I, I'm glad you said that because there may be people watching, they may have uh, a son or a daughter who has a 1973, well, it might not be 1973, but they're tinkering with something they, they just haven't been exposed to the work that you do. And the fact that there's a whole industry out here that really would be a vehicle through which they could fuel their passion, become an entrepreneur. So I'm glad you said that just a moment ago because there may be so many young people who may be family members, friends, mentees that people watching know would be great at going and being exposed to the work that you do thinking about that as a, a career. So thank you for sharing that, that your pain point might be someone else's joy point and there might be a great, a great collaboration on that. Uh, how about you, Daryl? What, what's the hardest part of being in your industry? Well, I'm gonna start where Nick um, left off and that is, you know, cultivating the next um, generation of builders, you know, finding that able talent um, so that you can have a succession plan. You know, moving forward, you know, I'm, I'm 58. You know, I have um, more yesterdays than tomorrows. I mean, we really, you know, not to be funny, but be, be frank about it. So, you don't know, want to pass that baton, but, you know, having the, um, you know, the ready talent to take the baton and move with it and uh, carry on is a challenge I think we all face. Um, but, um, you know, particularly to this industry, is um, you know, just establishing a realistic business model, defining your niche. Mm -hmm. You know, I love hearing his story, like, you know, he had to pivot, you know, mm -hmm. being flexible, um, you know, um, environmental changes that impact you, such as the pa a pandemic, you know, will require you to be flexible, um, agile, and have an agile business model that you can pivot on the moment. So. You know, just um, at this point in time, we're still new at this. We just, um, we started in 2021, um, one year ago, April. So we just passed a year for Ashe Design Studio. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been right now trying to get the brand out there mm -hmm. because we are small. And we don't have access to certain things. So it's like, you know, and now we talk about that later in terms of, you know, uh, having someone to market, having the resources they have, someone to market, effectively market and package, message your, um, your product. That's a huge challenge for this industry in particular, because there are a lot of people who make it things. But what is the special? What, what is the special? What is your product? What is the special about your product? What you produce? Mm -hmm. that will make people invest or choose what you have over another product. Differentiate. I love, no, I love how you said like the uniqueness, right? Your, your, um, 
you know, how do you get into that niche market? Someone has asked, because you all both talked about the talent pipeline, um, do you do internships? Do you do, are there, are there opportunities potentially for people to come and learn or come in to see uh, if they might be interested in, in, the, in the trade? There are yeah. always, um, yeah, there are always opportunities, um, but that takes time to really, uh, I don't want to, we don't want to just bring someone in here and just drop them in and um, not um, give them the care and yeah. guidance needed to really um, develop their skills, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so that in a stuff, you know, trying to find the time, that's the most precious resource we all have you know, yes. um, to um, really have that, uh, give care and attention to an internship. Hopefully we'll have something coming down the pike pretty soon, but I don't want to get ahead, you know, because I, um, if I get too ahead of us, I might, you know, get um, pay, um, pay a price later on. Yeah. Like, you know, Daryl, you know, you're, you're over promising there, you know, but um, you know, we are trying to establish something uh, because that's, you know, that's part of our vision is to have a place where folks can, um, come and develop their skills and talents. That's great. That's great. How about you, Nick? Are there internship opportunities? Um, opportunities come in shadow? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're always open to chatting with future makers. Uh, you know, I've, I've given that talk or that coffee uh, many a times over the years. And so I'm always open to that. Uh, in terms of the formal program, you know, our vision for the future is to have an apprenticeship program. Uh, we are currently just not of the size to be able to do that because as Gerald alluded to, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of yeah. attention. If you want to do it properly, if you actually want to yeah. give people the value that they're going to try to get out of this to make it into a career, you know, yeah. uh, a small team of us you know, can't do it because we, we need to be focused on producing and we need to be focused on you know, making sure that our clients are happy. And uh, we can't do that while trying to juggle, um, juggle that with too many other things. Uh, but you know that is something that we want to do. That is the only way that we see a path forward in the future. Because uh, as our you know, current workforce uh, starts to age out, we're going to get, we want to make sure that they're trained and they're trained in you know, all the years of experience that we have. You know, the easiest way to do it is hands on. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. This question came in through um, uh, uh, our chat, which is. How did you go about building your clientele? So, right. So, first, you have an idea, you make the product for yourself, you bake it for your friends and family. Your friends and family say, I can't buy all of your stuff. You have to have another market for, 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 your, for your products. So, how did you go about building that external market, that sort of public market and market demand for your work? I'll start with you, Nick, and then Daryl. Okay. Um, well, I guess a little bit of disclosure here. I am terrible at sales and marketing. Like, I really am. Like, this is not something I know how to do. Uh, you know, I'm really good at figuring out how to build things and how to build them. Uh, that was not something I was good at. So it was slow in the beginning. And I benefited from uh, a few friends that knew people in the industry and could put me in front of somebody. And, you know, they gave me a chance. And by that, you know, we, we built one thing for something for someone and we built another thing for someone else. And it slowly worked over time. Yeah. Uh, it was a long, slow build uh, to get where we are today. Now, mm -hmm. knowing what I know, you know, it's, it's much easier. I know, I know the field, I know the people we need to talk to, I know the things that, um, you know, their pain points. So we know how to try to solve for them. But the original process was not pretty. Uh, we had to do a lot of work, uh, do, do a lot of things that, you know, some things panned out really well. Other things we were like, we'll never do that again. And uh, you, you find out then where your audience is. And now I can describe my audience very clearly who they are and how they think and what they do. But it took many years to get there. That's, I mean, it's helpful. And that's also very encouraging for people because everybody's not in sales. Uh, I come from a sales family. Um, so, uh, yeah, I witnessed my dad selling televisions, my brother sells telephones. So I, I see salesmen all the time, but you're right. You know, if you don't come from that, you know, very helpful to understand, like it is, it may be slow, but it then becomes steady um, and you can grow from that. But 
you know, everyone's not going to be a salesperson, um, but seeing how you've grown it through great product. And I think one thing that entrepreneurs come on here every week talking about is just the quality of the product and word of mouth will start to sell yeah. your great work. I don't, um, you know, you alluded to that, but it sounds like that's how you've been able to really build a clientele. Is that sort of accurate, uh, Nick? That is very accurate. You know, word of mouth is how we almost 100% uh, succeeded in the beginning. And <laughs> someone telling someone else, or, you know, it was going to the right show and talking to someone and there was just someone else there that could vouch for you and say, yes, they do great work. Give them a shot. And that was how we grew. Yeah, absolutely. Daryl, and I know you say we are just getting started. All of us are just getting started. But how, how have you been able to build your clientele? Because we heard about you, Daryl. Um, you and Lawrence, we heard about you before we got to meet you. Um, okay. So clearly you have a following. <laughs> clearly you have. You have huge fans, huge uh, supporters. So how did you, how have you thought about and even started building your clientele? Well, I tell you, again, it happened organically. I came into a ready um, clientele base, you know, just working with Little Kingdom Porcelain at New York Now um, gift show. Mm. Um, and most of their wholesale clients became my initial clients. And it sort of grew from there. But the, the challenge I have now is it's no longer a story about Deep Patterson Design Studio and it's sort of about me. It's a story about us. Our Shape Design Studio is a short story about us and what we're making. So trying to message that or trying to transition yeah. from the tabletop of Deep Patterson Design Studio to the furniture, et cetera, of Our Shape Design Studio has been a task. And I have not been successful. That transition has been very rough. Yeah, but it's okay. I'm learning in the um, we're learning in the process, and um, it takes time. It takes time to build. It takes time to message that um, mm -hmm. that and really um, orchestrate that transition. And I did it. Um, I have. I'm not good at that. Um, I'm trying to get better every time, you know. But I, every uh, failure, I use as an opportunity to um, yeah. sort of improve and. Hopefully we will, um, yeah, we will um, sort of message that transition a little better in the next coming months because we are trying to, we are working up on a big campaign that I cannot talk about right now, but yeah, well, so just a teaser, a teaser. It's a teaser, it's a teaser. Yeah, I was about to get you to, I was about to, was about to do an Oprah um, and see, try to see. get all into that business, <laughs> but no, I'm not going to do it, not going to crack, not going to crack the egg, um, but you, I mean, I think it's really helpful for you to say this because companies do this all the time. You had your own brand. Lawrence has his own brand. You merge, you become a new company, a Shade Design Studios. Companies pay people millions of dollars to manage that brand transition, right? Into a new brand, a new name. Happens all the time in, 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 in corporate world. So you are not alone. It's not an easy transition, but I, I'm, I'm happy that you talked about it because there may be people and entrepreneurs on who are thinking, I wanna go with a partner and we're gonna come out and emerge as a new brand. And you're talking about, it's not gonna be easy to emerge as that new brand. It takes time and hopefully this platform, you know, you're on Johns Hopkins platform, hopefully that will help clarify for the world. But um, I'm glad because there probably are people who are wondering how, how will I do that if I, Bring on a business partner. But let me just add to let me just add to this, um, sure. Alicia. You know, um, we are we we maintain some autonomy with our own brands. Yeah. Yes. So he maintains Heavy Paper Co. I maintain Deep Pass Design Studio, and our collaborative practice is our shape. So that I does see. add that adds a level of complexity to that messaging. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really important. No, and truly, you are both artists. So you would have your own particular identities and then the collaborative would come together. So excellent, excellent point. Let me ask this question, which um, came in in the chat on Zoom, which is what are two nuggets? So they, get, they asked us for two, they, they, they bound us. Two nuggets of knowledge that you can share with this group when someone is hesitant of join, jumping into entrepreneurship. So let's say someone is saying, you know what? talented, I have a product, I want to own a business, but I have these reservations. What's two 
pieces of advice or knowledge that you would share with someone. Nick, what, what would you say to that person? They asked for two, so you have to, have to, you have to deliver, you know. All right, narrowing it to two. Uh, so yeah. the first one, and you know, this is something, you know, going back to my own experience, I wish I had done more. Talk to as many people as possible. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I thought maybe I talked to five, 10 or 20. I thought that was enough. That number should have been closer to 100. Really mm -hmm. talk to as many entrepreneurs, especially in related fields as you can. Seek them out and be a hunter for them. Uh, you know, what I've learned then over the years, subsequently talking to people in related fields, is just mind opening. Yeah. Uh, you know, what you get out of that 15 minute coffee. And if you can do that before you jump in, you'll just be so much better prepared. You know, mm -hmm. I had a, a written business plan when I started. And while it was a good skeleton, it was a good framework, it was still nothing like what it was going to be like once I yeah. finally opened the doors. And, yeah. uh, you know, those, those years of knowledge where I had to fill that out could have been you know, pre-filled, if you will, if I would have talked to more people and gotten some more experience and insights. Uh, it would have been, you know, that much more of a, less of a learning curve for me when I, when I finally did start. Um, and, you know, the, the second one, uh, you know, I kind of lose this at the beginning. Don't wait. Don't uh, wait. Don't wait. Do it now. It's it, there. There's, there's nothing that is going to, there are very few things. I won't say nothing. There's very few things that are going to get better by, by waiting and saying, Oh, I'll do it next year. Or I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it once this, you know, this thing is paid off or I'll do it once I learn this, you know, do it now. Uh, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Great nuggets of advice. I'll tell you, we had a, a 12 year old entrepreneur on here who had a smoothie business. And then one thing that she said was, if I could do it all over again, I would have started earlier. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know what, maybe five or five or six, but you, same point, everyone who comes on entrepreneurs say, do it now. Don't wait, don't delay. Um, and you can always pivot and you can always learn the lesson, but yeah, it's very hard. If you don't start, you can't, there's, you can't do anything with that. How about you, Daryl? What's your two nuggets? Two nuggets that they're asking for that you would share. Someone's hesitant about jumping into entrepreneurship. Oh boy, Nick took one. I always say hit the go button. Don't fumble in the end zone. But um, I'm going to say um, one, always act with integrity, no matter what. Mm -hmm. People bind to you before they bind to your brand. Sure. Okay. Um, the second would be two ingredients, consistency and persistence mm -hmm. to success. Even yeah. if you fall, use that fail, use that opportunity as a learning point. And if you hit rock bottom, don't look down because there's nothing to see there. Look up to what can be and keep going. Yeah, yeah. No, great. Great points, really great points. And I think that both of you just um, said just really encouraging things to people who may be hesitant about thinking about this. One question we just received in as a follow-up to an earlier question that you talked about, and this is, someone wants us to drill down into like, how did you determine the demographics of who to market your products to? Um, did you do any market research? Did you have a marketing firm? How did you know you would fare well in the area that you're in now? Did you did you do any of that market research, Nick? I know you did the market research with family, friends in the family, but did you do any have a marketing firm consult with you? No, nothing professional. Uh, it was purely based off of you know my opinion, and so that was very biased at the time. And, uh, you know, looking back on it, yeah, I probably could have done more to solicit uh, some more unbiased opinions. But really, I was just looking at what was going on in the marketplace, uh, the things that I was building, you know, for myself, my own personal use, and, you know, what our needs were. And, you know, I was just talking to people, they're like, well, I could use that too. Because uh, that's literally what we were doing. We were buying other products and we were modifying them for use for our own, in our own house or in, in something, some other location. And, uh, you know, that's how I was like, well, if we've got it, I can't be the only one. And from talking to a few other people, you know, other folks also want that too. So that's how it started. Oh, excellent. How about for you, Daryl? In terms of? 
marketing? How did you determine oh. that this would be your marketing? Did you use a marketing firm? We no, no, that and that um, we had to get creative. You know, we, yeah, you know, the, the three things that we need most resources, resources, resources. And that takes resources to do that whole, you know, um, a, a, a comprehensive uh, marketing research. Um, but we had open studios mm -hmm. before opening the store. Oh. And what we do is invite, um, invite our friends and family and the community in, and we will have simple products out, things that are in progress, things already made, and sort of, you know, sort of um, gauged, uh, just um, took notice of who was interested in what. Mm -hmm. And we're still in that process, right? Mm -hmm. But we have a pretty good niche, you know, based on following and um, who have purchased from us, we have an idea now yeah. um, that you know, who we market to, um, but um, it's, we would like to expand that market, yes. How we go about doing it, we have no clue. No you know, still, it's, a, it's a work in progress. No work. You know what we're going to do? We're going to make sure both of you get all the information for the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program and some other resources that we can make sure you get in your hands. Because as you talk about your businesses, it's so vital that we ensure that businesses like yours exist in our community and that we show a pathway to, to, to business enterprises that really contribute deeply. Because both of you have talked about that in your, and you're just talking about how you started your business, what it, what it has meant for the um, community and for yourselves to have these um, thriving businesses. Let me ask this, which is a question that came in on text. Someone did this. I'm going to make sure you get your question in. So don't worry. I, I get all the questions. I'll make sure they get in, which is what inspired the name? So monkey in the metal. What, what is Nick? Do you, what, what's that name come from? Oh, sure. Uh, so when I was originally thinking of the, the names, this, name this company, I you know, came up with all kinds of serious names. And, uh, you know, I look over at my wife and then my you know, oldest daughter, who's you know, their youngest at the time, and she was just, you know, they both just kind of thumbs down, like, no, nah, no, nah, it's forgettable. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like every other company out there. And then I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll take a page out of the uh, bar name book. Uh, usually it's, a, it's an animal and a noun of some sorts, right? You've heard of places, you know, pig and whistle, goat and a bell, things like that. So I looked at it and said, Sienna, what's your favorite animal? And she goes, monkey. Okay, how am I gonna make a halfway serious name out of this? And so I was like, monkey, and I was like, I don't want to work with steel, I want to work with iron, I want to work with metal. Mm -hmm. And she blurted out, monkey in the metal. Uh, and I'm like, okay, that's it. And stuck. She has she has a new she has a new uh, career in, in um, she has a new career in uh, naming businesses now. Yeah. I mean, how old was she at the time? Oh gosh, she was probably you know three four years old at the time. She's tell I'm a lawyer. Tell her to call me. I can make sure she gets paid <laughs> off for this. What she what she did. That people get paid a lot of money to do that. People get paid a lot of money to do that. No, excellent. Daryl, you told us about your your mom's name, Lottie's place. But what's the shade design? Where does that come from? Uh, shade is Yoruba for um, it's just what can be the possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and basically this um, whole our car, our experiment, this collaborative experiment is really looking at what can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything that we move, how we move forward with this, you know, with intention, yeah. but some things that happen organically. Yeah. It's all about looking and realizing what can be. Yeah, absolutely. Love that. I love the inspiration for your name. Let me ask you these last couple of questions as we wrap up. Um, and I'm going to wait till um, Jackie confirms that Oprah's watching to ask my Oprah question. But let me get this question in right now, which is you both discuss how challenging the first years of business were. What keeps you going? So, Nick, what keeps you going? Uh, seeing how far we've come. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's been a tremendous ride. And like I said before, it's had lots of ups and downs. I, you know, come close to, you know, I, more than I'd like to admit with saying, okay, that's it. We're not going to make it. And we're, you know, we're going to shut this all down. And it's, you know, taking a breath, uh, looking around, 
realizing how far I've come, saying, you know what, it's just a bump in the road. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to make this work. I'm going to figure it out. And uh, it's, that's the most rewarding part about it because if you're committed to it and you figure it out, you have something to be so proud of the next day when you wake up and you do it again. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I love that. Being able to look behind and see how, the, how far you come down the road. How about you, Daryl? What, what keeps you going? I agree, I agree wholeheartedly with Nick, you know, putting your journey into perspective, you know, um, and that one yes, in that one yes, when you've heard no. Yeah, yeah. We don't know how inspirational that can be, you know, yeah. and to give you the energy to move forward. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, Dave, this is going to be a challenge. Mm-hmm. It's going to always be a challenge. Uh, it is not a glamorous life by no stretch of the imagination. But when you realize that you can bring something from concept to commerce. Concept to commerce. I love it. It's going to come on every day. That's another another show, right? That's another show. No, I'm going to start using that. Commerce to concept to commerce. I love it. Yeah, taking something from concept to commerce, the reward of that, the feeling of that is immeasurable. It's a hobby that I can live on forever. Yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Let me ask this question. We have confirmed Oprah's watching. So Oprah at a different level, different platform, Hopkins, other institutions, individuals, how can we ensure, what are the things that we should do to ensure that companies like yours exist, survive, thrive and multiply. So what are like things that you would give to all of us who are watching as ways that we can contribute um, to the success of businesses and entrepreneurs like yourself? Nick, what would you, what's your piece of, your nugget of advice? Uh, I mean, it's, you know, follow your dreams, you know, for all those that are watching that really want to take a try at being an entrepreneur, then you know, just try it, do it, you know, and because that you because you do that, whether you win or you fail or you end up at somewhere in the middle, you will then further understand what all other entrepreneurs are doing. And then you will be more likely to also give a shot then to someone else that's starting out. You'll realize that you know, in the beginning, we don't have all the answers. We sometimes get it a little bit wrong. Uh, you know, stick by the companies that who then make it right, but you will have a greater understanding for what that is. And I think that's, you know, the, the best piece of advice I can give. That's great. And, and for like, for like Oprah watching, others watching, you know, we all can, as you said, give grace and to you, you know, purchase, right. And, 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 and give you our platforms as a stage to really get to a broader audience. How about you there? What, what's your advice to Oprah, all of us out watching? How can we be supportive? I don't want to say advice, you know, I just want to say, you know, I think what we all need is um, a level playing field when it comes to access to resources, mm-hmm. you know, so that we all can be prepared to scale up or do whatever we want, you know, however we envision our business, you know, whatever our, you know, um, vision might be, that we can realize that vision through the support, um, you know, just having access. That could be, um, you know, buddying up with someone, you know, as Nick alluded to, um, who is um, successful. Um, it could be a you know, mentoring program. It could be um, some type of, you know, loan program um, or just um, access to counseling. Mm-hmm. You know, um, all of those things that um, are needed, that infrastructure, that resource infrastructure to help and support small businesses um, grow and flourish. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I don't know anything that has already been said, but you know, when I look at Baltimore um, city, I think more of that is needed, especially for minority communities. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love what you just said, because it's very helpful to really think about resource and resource allocation and how are they distributed to ensure that individuals have access let me ask this, because everyone's wondering this, and we're, and in this, I want you to tell people how to get in contact with you. 
So why don't we start with that? How do people get in contact with you, Nick? They seen your designs. They're like, I want to, I want to purchase. I want to make sure that that's a part of my home, my office, my business. How do they get in contact with you? Sure. Uh, easiest way would be through email. You can email us at create at monkeyinthemetal.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also reach us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I will say I am not as quick at responding on social media, but I will do my best to get back to you as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, also call our shop, you know, 443-453-9625. You go to our website, you'll find all those different methods to contact us right there on the top. So monkeyinthemetal.com. Excellent. Excellent. Dale, how do people get in contact with you? Um, email, that's um, design 520 that's A-S-E. D E S I G N 520 at gmail.com. Um, either Lawrence or I will get back in contact with you. We are also um, available or accessible through um, Instagram. That's some um, Ashe Design and Lottie's Play Store. Excellent. And you have a website. We are working on the website. Yes. Okay. We are working. We do have a website. A lot of this place um, store has a website that is under development, and hopefully we can, um, you know, make that live. The comments um, section of that live pretty soon. Excellent, yeah. excellent, excellent. So the last question I'll pose to both of you: What's next? What's the next big thing, Monkey in the Metal? What's the next big thing, Ashay's Design Studios? What, what can we what can we expect on the horizon? Nick, what, what's next for, for you all? Uh, for us, we need to find more space. Uh, more space! <laughs> we need more space. We, we need more equipment. We need more people. Uh, so we just, we need more space. So that's the, the next box to check for us. And if we can do that, then we can kind of keep growing and expanding uh, our presence. You know, our, our name says Monkey in the Metal, but we've, we've long since moved on and, you know, doing other things, wood fabrication, we are a solid woods and metal manufacturer here in Baltimore, and uh, we want to keep doing more. Uh, we need more space to do it and hopefully achieve our, our end dream of being an employee-owned company. That's, that's the final goal for me. That's the exit strategy. Oh, I love it. I love it. Employee-owned company. Excellent. You got to talk to the Harker brothers. They came on and told us about how they made it. I have talked to Sean. Yes. Oh, he's, Sean's a good man. Good man. Good man. Good man. Uh, great, great, great. Excellent. I love it. Daryl, what's next? What's the next big thing? Oh, wow. I mean, there are several things. Uh, we're trying to launch a furniture line, um, hopefully this fall, if not the winter of um, 2023. Uh, but more immediate, we have been, Asha Design Studio was selected by the American Craft Council to curate the 1,000 square foot pavilion at the American Craft Made Show that's going to be at the Baltimore Convention Center, May 20th to 22nd. And we have... Um, pulled together um, a wonderful um, array of um, talent, uh, talented uh, makers. So if you have time, um, it's the show is free this year to encourage um, participation. Um, the Saturday, Friday and Saturday is going to be uh, open from 10 to 6, 11 to 5 that Sunday. And that Saturday evening, we have a, an event here from 6 to 8. It's a reception. Our um, practice and store located at 520 Forest Street. That's capital F-O-R-R-E-S-T. We're in the Old Town section of um, Baltimore City. And our building is called Art at 520. So not only will you see our wares and what we have um, in our store, but you'll also be able to visit six other studios in this building. Great. Some painters, some artists, some other makers. So yeah, come on now. We will have adult beverages and some light beer. Excellent, excellent. That's great. May 20th through 22nd. We're going to get the flyers. So if someone may on JH Connects, don't worry. We'll make sure everyone gets that. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Nick, for being on Entrepreneurship Matters today Thank and you. wishing you both all the best. You are two of the best of Baltimore. We're so glad that we got to lift you up and feature you today. Um, I want to, before I close out, I want to tell everyone, tune in next week to hear about two authors who are entrepreneurs, Dee Watkins and Thibault Mannequin. We will have both of them on. You do not want to miss this conversation. It will be uh, amazing. 
Follow us on JH Connects on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Email us feedback, jhconnects at jhu.edu. I want to thank all of our partners, Johns Hopkins University, Johns Hopkins Health System, the Mayor's Office of Small Minority Women Owned Business, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program, and Bloomberg Philanthropy. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Daryl. Thank, thank you, everyone, for watching. You, our pleasure. Thanks for your thoughtful questions. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>